Now, your fovea, as we looked at when we were going through the diagram, is towards the center of the retina, the back of the eye. It's where the cones in your eyes, the ones that enable you to be able to see light or to perceive color, cones are going to be clustered around the fovea, the fovea, and there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of those there. There's six million cones in your eye, and they're very light. Uh, sensitive and so that's why they're not as needed in terms of their um, number as rods happen to be because rods enable us to see in the dark and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Because there is so little color vision in the furthest periphery of your eye this is why we know that the eyes columns cluster around one another so you have very little ability to perceive color in the outer areas of the eye in the periphery, and this is because the cones all kind of center around the fovea, which is located towards the center. So the photoreceptors we've discussed are rods and cones. Cones, as I said, six million of those, they're located in the fovea, and they are color sensitive. They enable us to see color. We have blue, red, and green cones in our eyes. Their sensitivity to dim light is very low. They're, they're not very active in those scenarios and their ability to detect detail is very high so um, your ability to distinguish the various different features of you know me the, the background of the of the video and all that kind of stuff is due to your cone the number of bipolar cells that your cones has you know those cells that we need to kind of activate the ganglions to send on the info and transmit it into visual stimuli that the brain can understand each cone has its own bipolar cell. Now, in the opposite to this, we have rods, 120 million of these. That's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And that's mostly because they are not color sensitive and they're very sensitive to dim light. So it enables us to be able to see in the dark. And so that is why we need so many of the rods. Their ability to de detect detail is fairly low and they share bipolar cells with other rods, so they don't have their own individually. So important you know the differentiations between these. Cones enable us to see in light, and they enable us to see color, and rods enable us to see in dim light. Interestingly enough, a good way to kind of understand this is how long it takes you to adjust when you turn your lights out when you go to bed. Typically what happens is, you know, your, your cones have been in operation for a while with the light on, once you turn them off and you're trying to get to back to bed, you kind of have to stumble around and, you know, feel your way around because things are not terribly defined for you as of yet. And it typically takes your eyes about 15 to 20 minutes to fully adjust to dim light. But once you're in that scenario and you can see outlines in detail, that's due to your rods. Now the bipolar and ganglion cells take the photoreceptor information and it turns it into uh, basically information that the optic nerve can take back to the brain and understand. So we're presented with visual stimuli and, the stimuli and those wavelengths of the stimuli of the world around us, visually speaking. The bipolar cells will take those to the ganglions, and then the ganglions will take the cells and transform them to the optic nerve, the axons of the optic nerve, because what that enables them to do then is to send those inf pieces of information on. Just remember, again, Repeat, repeat, repeat. We've talked about why that's important. Cones have their own bipolar cell, and rods have to share them with each other. As I alluded earlier, we have in our brain and in our eye nerve cells within the visual cortex that respond to very specific features of the stimuli we are presented with visually. For example, edges, angles, uh, length and movement. And there are even some detectors in our eye that are specifically determined for and their only sole function is to recognize human faces. So our ability to differentiate between one person over another is due to these very specific functioning nerve cells. If you think about it in kind of a more in-depth way, our brain's ability to go about and dividing all of the different visual stimuli that we're presented with into color and depth and form and movement and, uh, and to be able to do all of these things at the exact same time is kind of impressive and, and 
we don't typically think about it a whole lot in that regard, but our ability to do all of these different things simultaneously is called parallel processing. They're each able to happen all at the same time, and the brain is able to formulate and provide us with experiences that are pretty fascinating, all because of parallel processing. And so you can see here as an example, you, you know, are presented with this scene right here. Your retina, the receptor rods and cones within it, are going to uh, send this information to the bipolar cells, which will then send the information to the ganglion cells. They will take it and send it through to the visual cortex, to the brain's detector cells that enable you to complete feature detection. So you can see that there are um, you know, various different shapes in the background. There are you know, shadings to the walls and gradients of light and things like that. And that will then lead you to higher level processes within the cerebral cortex of the brain to respond to this information and the other feature detectors. So you can see you know, the differentiation. This is a human being here. This is the background that is present behind him. And then what enables your brain to fully you know, match all of this is the recognition from that higher level functioning. So this whole cyclical process, if you think about it, is incredibly difficult. And yet our brain is able to do it all because it goes in this cyclical formation where the information is sent to the visual cortex. The visual cortex will send it to association areas. And then it will all translate it into memory. Now, color vision is very important to know just because a lot of kids have uh, questions about it as to how it is that we're able to experience light, um, but also why it is that people aren't able to experience light. So, two theories behind this. First is the trichromatic theory. This is the also referred to as the young Helmholtz theory, and this is suggested that the cones in your retina are basically receptor sensitive to red, blue, and green colors, okay? In these cones, we have these photoreceptors that are sensitive to color, and uh, they uh, were able to, back in 1967, measure the absorption of the light spectra, or the color spectra, of visual pigments of single cones within the human eye. And so they were able to determine that there are blue cones here, green cones and red cones within our eye. If it's short cones, then, or excuse me, if it's a short wavelength, then they're linked to blue cones. If it's a medium wavelength, that's what enables us to see green. And then if there is a long wavelength, that is what enables us to see red. So color deficiency, technically it's not color blindness because people can still perceive color when they are color deficient. However, it's vastly skewed. Um, the most common form of color blindness is usually that ability to distinguish between red and green. It's also difficult to distinguish or possible other kinds of color blindness are red, green, yellow, or blue, yellow color blindnesses. And we'll give examples of those in a bit. Interestingly enough, color blindness is passed on via the mother, and it is typically found much more so in men than in women. Complete color deficiency does exist out there in the world, but it's very, very, very rare. And in that scenario, it would be like you are essentially watching a black and white movie all of the time. The reason why a person develops color deficiency is that their cones have basically a, and a lack of a, an ability to perceive a particular color, or there's just a very high weakness within those cones of being able to detect a specific color. So you can see here examples of how it is like for a person that has this deficiency. Very difficult to distinguish the different colors that are here. You can see normal vision, this very bright purple, but for those that have red-green deficiency, it's kind of like a, a very dull blue. For those that have normal vision here with all of this red, for those with red-green deficiency, it would just kind of look all like yellowish and just kind of blah. And so it's really not an issue for them of just having no color uh, distinguishing capabilities because that's not typically the case. It's just that their ability to see them as they were intended is, is slightly off. You can see here as well examples of what it's like for those that have color deficiency with examples of art. So colors are not nearly as vivid to them or in some scenarios not even distinguishable uh, from other aspects of the artistic rendering.
second theory behind how we process color is the opponent process theory. So, Edvold. So, where this is concerned, Evil Herring is the one who establishes the opponent process theory. And he argues that we process four primary colors and their opposite pairs. And so by that, he argues, we have red. So by that, we have red and green. They are our opponent process pairs. Blue and yellow are opponent process pairs. And black and white are opponent process pairs. And so these will enable us to see if we stare at them for an extended period, we will see their opposite. We have several activities that we'll do with you in class to be able to show just how significant the opponent process theory is in explaining our ability to perceive color because it's, it's, it will be very surprising to you just how well this explains our visual capabilities. One last thing to discuss is color constancy. This is when the color of an object is going to remain consistently even, even if light and wavelength will change. So for example, uh, your ability to see the green of these apples. If I were to turn the lights off and I had presented this image to you in class, you would still be able to see and distinguish that color even after I turned the lights back on and it wasn't as easily seen on the smart board. Our ability to, to perceive that is color constancy. So hopefully this was not too terribly confusing for you. I know there was a lot in terms of differentiation of various different neural cells. So please come see me if you have any questions with regard to vision and visual processing.